unfortunate truth, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand $300,000 is not a lot of money in 2023. Disappears fast. It disappears extremely quick. Inflation has caused costs to go up. The real estate market over the course of 2020, 2021, 2022 has made so many people wealth, like in that sort of range, like the one hundred to $400,000 range where they now have equity, they've sold house, they have that in cash. The number of people that have that money has grown an incredible amount. And ultimately what that means is that the new level for what's considered wealthy is higher, right? All right, guys, welcome to this episode of the Collecting Keys podcast. This is our Wednesday Mike and Dan show where I, Mike DeHaan, and my co-host here at Dan Austin talk about real estate, investing, business, and everything in between. And Dan, believe it or not, this is episode 100. Dang, this is a century? This is the century. A century? Yeah, 100? so this is our, our 100th long form episode. We crossed 100 a little while ago if you count our our short Friday folks episodes, but those are a little bit different. So this is our number 100 episode long form. And so we are each going to be chugging a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle over the course of this 40 minute oh, episode. I got it right back there. If you, if there's any whiskey drinkers that actually watch our videos, like that right there is like a, I don't know, it's a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand bucks. It's a Pappy Van Winkle. Why are you pointing like you're trying to flex? No one's going to notice that you're working. <laughs> Can you see it? I'm pointing at it. That's a bottle of Pappy like that I won in a lottery. It's like I, but it was like a thousand bucks to buy, right. so I can't drink right it. Right here. And, right here. Is, <laughs> and go check out the YouTube a whiskey if you collection back there. Want to see Dan trying to trying to flex point to his whiskey Any bottle. opportunity I get, I try to throw in a flex. I mean, that's what you got to do, man, when you're a father of young kids. You know, your wife spokes on them. No one appreciates you anymore when you're in that phase. I am the most... That's right. Dads are the most unappreciated <laughs> group of people out there in the world. Or they're like overly appreciated to the point that it's kind of nauseating. It does frustrate women. I do know this as a dad and a spouse because men get a shit ton of credit. Like if I take my son in public, people are like, you're such a good dad. <laughs> like my wife takes him and my daughter, drag them around the grocery store. No credit, right? But if a guy takes their kid out and oh my gosh. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, you're, he's just hanging out with dad today. Wow, that's so great. It's that's like, funny. It is, especially with the older ladies. They complain about that, but when we get advice versa, you go into the professional world and everyone's like, you're a woman engineer. You should be so yeah, proud of yourself. True. And then with we men- We have a whole week <laughs> dedicated to you. <laughs> yeah, right. And now, now as a man, it's like, just shut up and do your job, asshole. Right, yeah. Like, <laughs> this is a great point. If everything balances out. If, if we could just get people to understand that, it all balances out. Some people get- you know, over here, you get a little benefit over there. You don't get so much benefit. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, exactly. It's all, if you do anything that's outside, like the social norm, people tend to notice that and, you know, good or for bad, that's what else happens. But anyways, episode 100. And uh, here's one thing that we know. If you have been listening to this show for the last 100 episodes, or I say like the last like 85 episodes, if you go back to the beginning, you can probably skip the first 15 um, but, I forgot about those episodes, the forgotten <laughs> episodes for a good reason. They're so bad, but people go back and listen to them all the time. But uh, if you've listened to the last 100 episodes, you're probably super freaking wealthy now. You've probably taken so much action about everything that we talk about every single week. You've gone, you've bought a bunch of properties, you've wholesaled some houses, you've created a huge income and built some incredible wealth for yourself. So we, <laughs> we were having a conversation before the show that is kind of an interesting talk about investing outside, of, like not even just like with real estate, but actually knowing how to invest to get the most bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this, you know, regardless of my sarcastic remarks about if you've listened to everything, you're probably super rich now. I do think that is a really interesting conversation because I have a ton of people who reach out on a regular basis, just asking about different questions. And one of the most common questions that we get is, hey, I have like, say, $10,000, $20,000, $50,000, what do you think would be the best way for me to invest my money? No joke, I literally had somebody that hit me up from GoBundance the other day and they said, hey, I have a million dollars in cash. What do you think I should do? And I'm like, that is su like such That's a such a wide, different problem. Yeah, such a different problem to have. But it brought up a very interesting conversation about how to figure out what to do with your money. And I think this is especially important when you start making money on a regular basis. And so, you know, we're in a position now, we've been running a successful business, we built up some cash, and all of a sudden you get all these people that start reaching out and they're like, oh, you wanna invest in a syndication. You're going, you wanna, you know, start this life insurance policy. You wanna buy this type of property. How do you actually decide what to do? 
Like, honestly. Right. And it's so hard. And you and I have actually over the last, have had kind of an extended conversation recently about this, like talking to other people and looking at our options just as individuals and as a business, to be honest, like you also look at what you can invest in as a business owner to keep your business growing. But from a personal finance standpoint, which is where we're getting at is like, everybody will, will want your money once they recognize that you have a little bit. And that's the way those people tend to make money. Perfect. Even if it's a syndication and it's a great syndication, it's a great syndicator. They make money, their capital raises, right? They make money on on that. And granted, if it's their own development deal, they make money multiple ways. And your money is only one of those ways. But financial advisors, insurance, people that sell insurance, as a generally the way they make money is if you sign up for insurance. And those are all great, like, ways to invest your money. I'm of the belief, and we can dive into how deep we want to on this, but like, I'm of the belief you should probably master only a few ways to invest your money. And that's because when you talk about layering on all these different ways to invest, I mean, anything's an investment. Anytime you put money anywhere and it brings back more money, that's considered an investment, right? Or the idea is that it should bring back more money. It could also lose money. I think about people that run family offices and that's what they do professionally, right? Wealthy people have a staff of people. They have a person that is an asset class expert in many assets that they are building their family office around and they're investing in higher risk funds typically um, because they have those experts, what would be higher risk to us. And the reason that what they do is they diversify out of just that one asset, right? So they have multiple assets that they're investing in. More, when I say assets, it could be funds and all that sort of stuff. As individuals, like going and getting a life insurance policy. When we talk about life, we're talking like whole life, universal life, those types of policies, going and opening up a brokerage account, going and starting to invest in real estate, getting help, you know, starting to invest as an LP and doing all of the things that you hear on podcasts is probably not the most efficient way to invest your money. That's just my belief and I'll throw it out there right away. Yeah, so I, well, I think yes and no. So I think that what you're saying is super applicable when somebody is building their wealth. I would say when you are kind of like under the one to $2 million net worth range, if you are trying to really diversify into all these different things, you are limiting your growth, you know? And I, I mean, I see like, maybe, maybe that's a little bit high, but I see a lot of people that have like a hundred thousand dollar net worth and they're like, I'm trying to diversify and spread my risk. And that's the kind of the ball. I would say, I would say probably anywhere, anybody under two to three million dollar net worth, depending on how they have that net worth made up, how they got to that net worth yeah. should be maybe limiting how much they're investing in different things yeah. or that's what they're doing full time. Then it's a different you know, story. Exactly. When you're when you're kind of lower than that, especially if you're in like the couple hundred thousand or even less net worth, you need to be going all in on the stuff yeah. that's going to maximize your return if you want to be wealthy. Mm -hmm. Like unfortunate truth. Hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand dollars is not a lot of money in twenty twenty three. Disappears fast. It disappears extremely quick. You know, inflation has caused costs to go up. The real estate market over the course of you know twenty 2020, twenty 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 one, twenty twenty two has made so many people wealth, like in that sort of range, like the one hundred to four hundred thousand dollar range, where they now have equity, they have sold house, they have that in cash. The number of people that have that money has grown an incredible amount. And ultimately what that means is that the new level for what's considered wealthy is higher, right? So let's just for context, I saw this statistic recently in like early 1980s, like 1982 or 1983 was the number, or 1983, so it was, was that 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. The $100,000 a year salary where people are like, yeah, I'm making 100K. Like, and we still talk about that. Like, oh man, making 100K is awesome. That same 100K that we're talking about is 300K in today adjusted for inflation. It's crazy, right? See, and that's just so adjusted for if inflation. If you're making 300K, you're doing awesome Yeah, in the 1980s standard. Yeah, right. And, so. that, yeah, and that's just adjusted for inflation. That's not adjusted for the increased cost of living that people have in general now. You know, we have a lot of extra fixed expenses. Oh, uh, true. So much more service-based stuff. Yeah, so much more service-based stuff. You have cell phones, you have internet. People have two cars. You have child care. You have child extracurricular activities. You have somebody walking your dog for you. Yeah, right. Dog, doggy daycare exists. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, right. We take our dog there. Yeah. So, but point being, so many people, they fixate on what they already have and they limit their ability to actually generate wealth because they are not leaning into what's going to produce the most return. And in my mind, when you are that sort of like lower net worth, like the like, you know, so, so let's just say 500,000 and below range, you should be going full in on yourself, right? To increase your skill set, 
and your knowledge and your ability to make money. And you should be going full in on any sort of like business endeavor or any sort of investment that is going to maximize your return that is in your control. So basically meaning not crypto or not buying like, you know, GameStop calls, right? Or whatever, right, right, or yeah. actually like, you know, learning how to flip a house, right? Mm -hmm. Putting money into that so you can generate large active income, learning to start a business, learning how to, you know, build a brand or e-commerce or whatever. Those should be your investments when you're in kind of like that under $500,000 range. When you start to get to like the $2 million, $3 million, $4 million range, I think I actually had a call today with someone from GoBundance who's like a wealth advisor. So I'm trying to sort of figure this out for myself. Because I've, you know, have this life insurance policy that I'm not entirely sure is right for me. It's a whole life policy. And I've just been looking at these different options. And he basically said, he's like, you should not be buying, like giving anyone any sort of like third party your money until you know what your whole financial goal is, right? Just like, you know, how much income right, you want right. to have, how much you want it to grow, what your risk tolerance is, all that sort of stuff until you know what that looks like. And then you need to be prioritizing, basically putting everything into different buckets. So he's like, you need to know how much you need to put into your business for your business to reach its growth goals. It's like, that should be priority number one. Your second priority should be how much money do you need to have on hand for yourself for if, you know, bad things happen in your life. So basically that's like your security. And then from there, you need to figure out your growth goals based off of how much you want to go into investments, what your risk tolerance is, and how much you want to hold in cash for basically, as you put like short to middle term stuff. So like whole life insurance policies, which is a cash like investment, hard money loans, or like debt based funds, CDs, or like treasury bills, things like that. Those are like short term, slightly lower yield stuff that you can get access to a little bit quicker. And how much money you put into those is kind of just dependent on what your overall goals are. And you understand you are giving up compound growth and other things by doing that, right? But you just need to make sure that you actually have like a holistic view about what you want your wealth to look like. We have kind of articulated this as I'm listening to what you're saying, because like, do you think those same rules apply to somebody that has an under $500,000 net worth or somebody who's working a W-2 job and has enough to put away a, what would be meaningful money to them, but not much else, but put it in a savings account so that one day they could buy their first house or, or invest in rental properties? Or do they need to go all in and take more of a risk and put it into that one investment? I think that the key thing is you need to be, do an analysis of what you want your lifestyle to look like, like realistically. And if you are comfortable with working your W-2, you're comfortable, so there's like going through the grind and you want to like, you know, you're relatively conservative in nature, then that same line of thinking could work a little bit, right? You're not, you're not going to ever achieve wealth if you diversify too much when your net, net worth is lower. But if you're listening to this podcast, that's probably not you, right? You're probably someone that wants wealth. You want a higher income. You want to escape your W-2. You want to have financial freedom. If that's you, you need to go all in into something that is going to maximize your growth and your income. It's going to be higher risk, it's going to be more work, but it's going to be something that's in your control and that's the only way that you are going to make real money and real wealth when you're at like that lower, that lower net worth and that lower income point. Right. And, that, and that's coming from two guys like us where we came from like W-2 jobs and we're like that traditional real estate investing kind of mentality at first. But then you recognize like buying one rental property is great. I have this whole belief of like the whole buying 10 rental properties in 10 years, which is I, I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Like, that's super freaking hard, uh -huh. like really hard. We've talked about this on the podcast before. It's like, that's really challenging. For a W-2 earner, right? For somebody For that w -2, is, yes. has regular monthly income and they have nothing else yes. outside of that. And you're taking your excess income, assuming that you're not making, you know, one to $2 million a year and you're buying $100,000 houses. Okay, that's a totally different ballgame, right? But for the average person who's buying assets within a reasonable distance of their well, right? That's really challenging. And for me, I started out buying one house, two house, and said, okay, I want to get three and four. And you run out of money quite quickly, even if you're making a good W-2 wage, but also you run out of opportunity. So at, at that point, you and I both pivoted to, we need to go all in here if we want to achieve our goals. And by all in, I mean, not like we just spent every single penny we own. I mean, we spent, we did go quite a bit all in as yeah. far as percentages of our net worths, honestly, to start this business at that point in time. And that's now how we can look back and tell you the story of how to do this and how to get here because it's not like we were anything special. It's just that we realized at what we wanted to get, we took that 
that stock and where we wanted to be and recognize that the traditional path, a lot of people at that time were talking, was it for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and there's a certain level of risk tolerance that you have to have, right? Which a lot of people don't. But I think the biggest thing too is understanding, like like changing that mindset around around your money to understand that there's always going to be more money, so always going to be more opportunities, right? And you're never going to reach like a level of financial independence or wealth or like a high income if you don't seek those opportunities yourself, which is like such a big thing that most people don't realize. Yeah, They always kind of like expect someone to bring it to them or they expect it to be something that sort of builds over time, which, you know, it kind of can, but you can expedite that process, right? If you go out there, yep. you can make like, I reflect on this kind of regularly of, you know, I started investing 2018, but like, when I worked my last engineering job, which I, which I quit in 2018, by all intents and purposes, from like the standard view, I had like kind of made it, right? Like, you know, we had dual income, we had low living expenses, we were able to save a lot of money. I had a good trajectory upward at my engineering job. I could have been very comfortable forever. And that was like kind of a hard thing to walk away from. But I can guarantee you that if I had stuck with that and tried to use this sort of like save and slowly invest mentality, I would not be even close to where I'm at right now. Right. Especially from the end, from network standpoint, it's just, it's just not, it's honestly just not feasible. There's only a yeah. small percentage of people yeah, then the W-2 realm that get to do that. Uh-huh. And that's usually the top executives. You know how hard it is to be an executive at a company that actually pays money? You're actually better off starting a small business and not not talking real estate or what we're doing. You're better off starting a small business to make a really good wage or an above average wage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if you're just like a one-man operator, especially right now, if you have like a service-based business, <laughs> yeah, right. like you could be a... I don't know, a person that cuts lawns and like it's like you and your 16-year-old son or your brother or whatever, you could probably make $150,000 a year at this point. Right. And you could, and it's a business that you could build to sell and yeah. then have a, have a good exit. It might not be like selling Amazon, but you could still, I know guys that are making, you know, up, depending on how big your company is, up to seven figures selling a lawn mowing company. Honestly, yeah. You know? So, you know, it's just, it's just interesting going, going through that um, and trying to figure out like the best way to really invest at those different levels. But ultimately, I think, I think the core thing is you have to have a plan about what you want your, you know, your lifestyle to look like and what your goals are and what your risk profile is and make decisions from there. And I'll, I'll also say too, if you are like seek out mentors that can help you with that, but ideally mentors that are not trying to make money off of you. Right. Which is a huge indicator. Because like there's a lot of people that you can hire to be experts, right? Or like wealth managers, whatever. But they make commissions. They're going to sell you whatever gets you the most commissions. Even if they're like a fiduciary or whatever, good for them. Like they still get paid based off of you doing business with them. My father always always used to tell me when you're talking about like finding a financial advisor or somebody that's going, that you're going to have to work with that makes money off of you, go and talk to three of them first. Yeah. And then go and talk to three people that are using services of people mm-hmm. before you make your decision. Because if you just talk to one person, you're going to get one person's point of view. And there's so much opportunity out there to talk to three people in any investment category, whether that's being an LP on a syndication. Go talk to three syndicators. You can talk to 30 in a week. They'd be all happy to take your call right now. Or three wealth wealth advisors, three guys that are pitching insurance, just kind of get the perspective yeah. so that it gets, because ultimately you got to do what's best for you. And if you don't know what's best for you, talking to one person is not going to, they're going to give you what they think is best for you, not knowing you. Yeah. And with that too, I think that it's important to have those conversations. So you like, you know, you get general information you just need to be hesitant to pull the trigger on, you know, giving anybody your money. And the diversification piece too, I think that as you start to make money and you start to have, you know, a couple million dollar debt worth, you have a high income. I think it, that's where it actually becomes important to diversify from just being in your zone all the time because stuff can change. And especially if you're smart enough to live below your means as your business continues to grow, you know, your investments continue to grow, you have all sorts of stuff, but you're able to keep your living situation kind of the same. If you invest like in a way that you diversify and you kind of spread that risk. If one of those buckets does go weird, the real estate market does crash. If the stock market does crash, if, I don't know, the crypto goes to zero, whatever you put your money in, 
at least you'll have these other buckets that can still sustain your lifestyle without it having to be the end of the world. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And maybe there's like a a point to, to uh, like a demarcation point here. So it's not that you have more to lose when you have more money. It's that once you have some of your basic needs taken care of and you're kind of at this point of like, I'm kind of taken care of for a long time, <laughs> whatever that is. Maybe that's like, I've got to a net worth of 1 million, 5 million, 500,000, whatever you need based on the on what lifestyle you live. Now you want it, you do want to start protecting some of that and you have the freedom to now diversify. When you're coming up though, like there's probably going to be points in time, like if you're going to reach some level of like high success where you are uncomfortably extended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and I have both been uncomfortably extended. We were still smart about it. I believe we were still smart about it. But I guess if like some black swan event happened, we could have been in trouble, right? But there are times where we had, especially starting out, extended a big portion. Of, I know when I bought my first rental property, I extended a huge portion of my net worth to do that because oh, yeah. I didn't have a lot of net worth. Yeah. I mean, like that thing is you will be extended and you will have to take that risk and you will have to accept that if you take that risk and things go sideways, you will be in a bad spot. But that is, yeah. that alone is why most people don't become wealthy. They're not willing to roll that dice. That's how you become above average. Otherwise, you can go get a job, put Hopefully you're fortunate enough to get a 6% match on your 401k and put that in there every year and you uh -huh. can max that out at like whatever we're at now, $20,000 a year and your tax advantage account. And when you're 65, you'll know exactly how much money you should have and that's what you'll get. Yeah, and, that, and that's the trade-off, you know, and if people aren't, aren't comfortable like straying from that, sorry, you don't get to have sorry. the early life wealth that other people yeah. that took the risk get. You know, you get the gold watch, just not the boat. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't think you get a gold watch anymore. <laughs> you get the retiree boat. I mean, there's a reason like most of the sports cars you see around are being driven by old dudes. They put their time I in. Know. You know, you I don't know. you don't see a lot of like 20 something, 30 something driving sports cars around. Right. That's true. Anyways, that's just something that we've been talking about a lot recently and it's come up a lot recently from different people. But um, point being, I guess I like, just to round that up really quick. If you are not yet wealthy, you're not yet where you need to be, you need to invest in yourself first. Don't be afraid to put those eggs in one basket, just do it in something that you can control, such as a business, yeah. real estate, anything to increase your income. And then once you have that money, it becomes, how can I spread my risk here to make sure that if stuff does get weird, I can maintain my lifestyle. And I yes. think that a lot of real estate investors, especially ones that run successful wholesaling, flipping businesses that end up sitting on a lot of cash, or have a lot of opportunities is something that they probably have to face on a regular basis. I know that I'm currently trying to figure out right now. I'm with you, man. It's a good good problem to have, but just something to think about. But yeah, so, yeah. you know, if you've been listening to all 100 episodes, I'm sure you have that problem too. Of course you have that problem. <laughs> of course you do. If, you, if you've been buying houses through 2021, 2022, you absolutely have that problem. This is very true. Yeah. If you were buying assets for the last <laughs> few years, you've got a little excess money that you have access to that you did not have or think you have. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So go on. If you have any questions about that, you can hit me up on Instagram at uh, Mike underscore invest. I'm always happy to chat with people. But anyways, real estate specific topic though, which I think is one that is super relevant. You had someone that actually hit you up from somewhere as opposed to me, which is a first because I feel like I do a lot more general putting myself out yeah. there than you do. You're very... Mike invest, Mike underscore invests forward. <laughs> I'm not quite as much investor man Dan forward, but I do love talking to people and I do talk to people quite often, but I did have somebody reach out to us and talking about farm markets and like how to pick those and how do we, how do we, cause we do a lot of virtual stuff. We have done many iterations of different marketing, like how we, and we've had to pick and select and we've done it, you know, locally in several markets as well. I don't know, how, how many markets do you think we've total marketed in Probably successfully? Probably 20-something at this point. 20-something across North America. Yeah, some of them we've, we've dropped out of. And I guess, let me, let me reframe that question a little more directly. Someone reached out and they said like, hey, you guys do a lot of virtual investing, marketing, wholesaling. Like, how do you pick like the criteria in the markets you're looking at? Yeah, what criteria do we use to say, this is where we're going to market or we think this is the market? And honestly, it's changed and adapted over the years too. So that's, where we used to be very data heavy. Uh -huh. And I would not say that the data necessarily speaks to that. Yeah. Like, would you say that data is a big, a bit, like when I say data, I'm talking like what we were taught how to do this in another mastermind, which is like, look at 
unemployment, look at employers, look at look at growth rates, look at median income, look at average household, look at the population size, look at this, look at that. There's like 10 probably different criteria that you could look at that were like probably somewhat arbitrary, to be honest. Yeah, that was, so the thing I don't like about that is about that sort of mentality of people are looking really into like the demographics and like specific areas is because essentially what you're trying to do is trying to look for a needle in a haystack, you're trying to find like the random town sure that no one cares about whatever I sort about look for opportunity there. And we take a little bit of a different approach. So, so first off, the core markets that we pick, we have our, our partnership program where we partner with these investors in a different market that kind of gives us like the general location we're going to start. Mm-hmm. You know, so we work with different investors around this part of our, our instant investor program that you can find at collectiquespodcast.com. We have like the third tier where we actually partner with people in these different markets, right? With that... Like them alone be having interest there, them being involved in the investor community there is enough to sort of like certify like, hey, look, there's somebody else that wants to buy there. There's probably opportunity, right? And there's, that could be in any market. It'd be in any market, right? We've done stuff as, as Big, huge. small. Yeah, little. we're doing stuff as huge and sort of like mainstream as Houston to as small as like some of these like Northeast markets and everything in between Montana, like you name it. We're, we're doing stuff in these in these different markets. The main thing instead of like looking at like all these really tight little demographics and like these numbers for these, uh, these different locations, what we do is actually very simple. We find like the key market where we know people are interested in living. It's a major market that tells you that, you know, people are live there, people probably invest there. And then what we do is we go about 45 minutes to an hour from the main city and we market there. That simple. The general thought being is, American cities, most of them, if they are growing, they grow outwards, okay? If you start going to these, these tertiary markets that are outside the main cities, and then and the great thing is, is there's thousands and thousands of these across the United States. So it's not yep. like we're, you know, saying like, oh, we go to Memphis and we look here. Like, yeah. you can go to Memphis and pick the cities that are an hour, 45 minutes to an hour away from you. Market there, you can know that it's going to have the interest of the local investors that live in in that Memphis area, um, at least the serious ones. Like I know for us, if we have like a good opportunity up in North Idaho or somewhere 45 minutes away, we don't go in like, ah, I don't care about that. We've literally done many deals like that, right? That same pattern is going to exist in these metro markets, but it doesn't have the sort of same effect that like there's been two dozen bigger pockets blog posts about it. You know, people have done virtual wholesaling podcasts about like, this is why Oklahoma City is the best market, right? They don't do any of that. Instead, you just find the little spots outside, market there. We do, you know, direct mail, SMS, targeting the most standard stuff, absentee, bankruptcies, liens, vacant properties. And that's it. You're going to get the phone to ring. Going to get the phone one, to ring. That's step one. And I want to stay on step one for a minute. Uh-huh. Getting the phone to ring is step one. Yeah. And picking your market is like, I guess, step zero. Uh-huh. There's reasons, there's several reasons why you wouldn't want to go to the bigger pockets or the Google top 10 markets to live in, like Austin, Texas, for example. Why market there? Like you could market there, but your cost per deal gets pretty high and you're probably better off being connected and paying a premium price for whatever you want to do there. Because the people that are able to invest successfully in Austin are having much lower profit margins. Back to our earlier conversation when you're coming up, you need to have really high profit margins. You need to go all in on something with the best ROI you can. A 4% ROI on a large development in Austin is not nearly as good as a 25% ROI on a single family home somewhere else outside of Austin when you have limited funds, right? So that's that's one reason. It's just challenging and your cost per deal is so much higher that you're, you'll get starved out by other players or other developers or whoever that is in those big markets because trust me, they come there and they come with lots of money. Yeah. The second thing I would say about picking your market, you're talking about tertiary markets where we, we do find some folks have a challenge and, and it's may, sometimes a personal challenge where they live in a town of say 20 to 30,000 people. That is maybe 45 to an hour from a larger market but it's more of a, I would consider that kind of a smaller rural market. The challenge they have is, is everybody in town knows who they are. Uh-huh. So they're like, well, if I get a property under contract and I try to sell it to, to Billy Bob over there, like, then they're going to know that I sold to Billy Bob and they're going to be mad at me. And everybody in town's going to be mad at me. They're not going to pat me on the back when I'm at the bar. That is a challenge you have to get over if you're living in a small town and marketing in a small town. Easy to get over because I think you can also become 
the awesome, badass local guy that everybody knows that go to and you don't even have to market to them eventually because they just call you because they know you, mm-hmm. you know, Joe Blow that buys houses and renovates them and turns them into nice homes that everybody in town likes because it fixes up their small dying town. Exactly. Yeah, you just got to, when you're in those sorts of things, you got to have more BDE. More BDE, absolutely. <laughs> more big day and energy and then confidence yeah. going into those. But think about that. Yeah. You do need to think about that of going too rural or too small. That's one piece of it, but also that, there's just not an, enough opportunity, right? If you're in a town of 30,000 people and you want to own 500 doors, this is a, just an example, you're going to run out of houses to buy. You're just a her. And it's like, funny. You know what I mean? And that's literally somebody we're working with right now. They live in a very yeah. small town and he's like, I want to buy 200 properties. So you're like, bro, that's half the town. Yeah. Like eventually you will run and, and he knows that. <laughs> he's like, okay, I'm going to probably have to go to another town eventually. But when you're that small, but people are like, oh, I would never go to a small town like that. You should definitely like look at something like, if you're going to go virtual and you don't know anything about it, don't go to a town where they have one major employer and, and it's only a town of like 10,000 people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that major employer happens to be like a sawmill that goes out of business because for whatever reason, that's a bad idea. If you live locally in that town, there's probably a different play that you might want to, you might be looking at. So make sure you do look a little bit at that. But I wouldn't spend too much time trying to find the best data, the best demographics. If it's a place that people live and is generally close to place another place other people really like to live, it's probably a good market to go to. Absolutely. And and I think that that's one of the reasons people get stuck is, I mean, everyone like they want to be in the like the hottest market. They have this sort of mentality of like, oh, I want to be in Seattle in the 90s or San Francisco in the 80s or whatever back before these places blew up. And you could buy a house of 300 grand that's now worth like 4 million bucks. That if that is your exit strategy, you shouldn't be a real estate investor. Like, honestly, <laughs> like, like, like there are so many more ways that you can make money. And like, you know, you go to the small tertiary market, you can still figure out a property's worth $300,000, $200,000 and buy it for 50% off. Right. Right. And you still make your spread that way. Like that 50% discount is exactly the same in Austin, Texas versus, I don't know, Springfield, Illinois. Right? Is that a is that a small town? I don't know. I I, might, I think we used to market there actually. No, that was um that was Springfield, Ohio. Oh oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm saying though? Like like you don't have like you can still get the discounts in these other markets. And the thing is too is people fix it on like these really small areas. I just looked it up. There is a hundred and twenty nine million households in the United States. Most people are trying to buy like 10 or like 20 if they're feeling ambitious. Why don't you be more open to where those 20 are? Totally. You know, like, like, sure, if you could own 20 houses in Austin, Texas, in Orange County, California, whatever, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But that's also going to take a lot of money. It's going to be, you're going to be competing with all the people that have big money. And it's just going to be like, you know, it's more of a speculation play because you're not going to have an immediate return, right? Versus if you go to whatever town in, somewhere else that is tertiary, 45 minutes to an hour from like a major metropolitan area. It's ideally in the path of progress. You can usually kind of figure that out and you buy 20 properties there. You're probably going to be just as happy in 10 years as if you bought those properties in Austin, Texas, honestly. Right. I mean, and you're saying like being open to it, right? Guy in my GoPod in GoBundance, Brandon, shout out. One of the places he markets in is Little Rock, Arkansas. He lives in Dallas but he markets Little Rock, Arkansas. Like I would have never in my life thought I'm going to go market to Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm from Washington, right? I'm up here. That's not an option. But now that I've talked to Brandon, I'm like, dude, he's killing it. Like that's yeah. a great market. He's built relationships with all the right people. He has a pretty good portfolio that's growing pretty rapidly. And he has found for him, that's a niche that works really well going to that. And he's got a couple other markets that he actually buys in as well. And so what thought do you need to put into that other than Little Rock, Arkansas as a city? And I could buy houses there and it's decent city. I mean, I don't know what else to to add to that as far as demographics that I would look at. Yeah, I mean, that that's kind of it, right? And I mean, you're talking about Little Rock, Arkansas. How many people have thought about Arkansas that don't live in Arkansas over the last 30 days? <laughs> Not, Not very a many. Lot. It's outside of the general public eye, right? And I think that that alone is is a great way to identify a market. And then when it comes to marketing in those areas, like I said, we just do the most standard thing you can think of. We go and we pull the same list that everyone else does. You can find on YouTube. We market to those consistently. You do it over a consistent period of time with a strong brand behind it. And you, most importantly, you have a sales and follow-up process. That's where a lot of people also, you know, miss out. And that's where the opportunity comes from. 
right? And it's not rocket science. So many people, they're like, well, I'm trying to decide between the market that has 1.8% and 1.6% growth. And then this one, they just have this new facility open up there, whatever. Like, you don't need to get that granular. You're not a freaking hedge fund. You're someone that's trying to buy 10 to 15 houses. And so you can have cash flows, you can leave your W-2. Yeah, and you can certainly do that. Yeah, exactly. You can stop trying to find the needle in the haystack, the golden goose of like all this data just to procrastinate on actually having to do what you know you need to do. Right. And then again, get the phone to ring. We yeah. can show you how to do that. We talk about it all the time on this podcast and get the phone to ring. Exactly. And then your follow-up is up to you. You've got to crush the phones and uh-huh. make sure that those people know you want to buy their house. Yeah. That will be your key to success. It is. And again, depending on the, the markets, like you and I have marketed in some of the hottest markets, Boise, Austin, the only difference there is, is your cost per lead is going to be much higher. And uh-huh. do you really want to spend that much cost per lead if your goal is to own Again, 15 properties, cash flowing X amount. Those are appreciation markets that have topped out. Like I would probably stick away from that because it just doesn't make any sense for where most of the people that listen to our podcast are in their investing careers. That's not where you need to be. Yeah. And if you want a wholesale, that's even more relevant. You don't want a wholesale in the hottest market, right? Because not only do you have all the homeowners that are trying to buy properties, but you have all of the people that have migrated there that are like, man, I just got this job at freaking... Facebook in Austin and I'm fucking miserable and I want to get into real estate here locally now. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> right? You're absolutely competing right. with them, so. Yeah, there's a lot more competition. That's why cost goes up okay. a lot with everything. It's not like you're going to just, the people that made all this money, why, why it was super hot is already gone. Uh-huh. So don't even, just don't even worry about it. Yeah, exactly. So point being, don't overthink it. Tertiary markets, do the simple thing, have a sales process. It really is that simple. I hate to break it to you. Like even in the instant investor program, we go into a lot of details about how, kind of how to build the foundation of it. But it's always funny as we go through and I start talking to some of the people that are in it and they're like, so that's kind of like it. I'm like, yeah. They're like, well, what do I do while I'm waiting for the leads to come in? I'm like, I don't know. You wait. <laughs> like exactly. you, you start building connections with buyers. Like, you know, it's, yep. it's not that incredibly sophisticated. And like really what you do is you prep your sales system so that when leads do start to come, you start to have a backlog. That's where the real work starts to come. But when you're starting out, it really is that simple. For sure. And a lot of people try to overcomplicate it because they feel like it should be harder than it actually is. So simple. Cool. Right on. Anything to finish up with that, Dan? No, I think uh, we beat uh, beat the dead horse there on that. Keep it simple, stupid, whatever we want to we want to call that. We need, a, I guess, a T-shirt for this now. Um, <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. I kind of like that versus when they say keep it stupid simple. Isn't that what it's supposed to stand for? I have no idea. I've always just said keep it simple stupid. (laughs) I'm pretty sure it's not supposed to be like inflammatory. It's supposed to be keep it stupid simple. See, here's how ignorant I am to (laughs) social behavior. I didn't think that was inflammatory. I was just like, I just thought that was a funny way to say it. Yeah, they're not going to like tell you that like corporate environment where they're like, yeah, keep it simple, you idiot. Keep it simple, you stupid person. (laughs) No. That's funny. Well, let's keep it simple, listeners out there. Is Easy. that more PC? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. But anyways, guys, thanks for listening to the show. 100th show, please. Yeah, this our, is great. Our 100th show. Get out show. there and give us a shout out for us making it 100 because this is an accomplishment itself for us, like 100 episodes. And to actually have people that like our show, which we do get regular feedback, and keep it coming. We love it. But like, that's a big step for where we came from. We it should is. we should show some gratitude. We should. I, to I, ourselves. I show gratitude all the time, man. It's funny. Like, I will say that that is, like, I get more excited about people, you know, not even like, like, like instant investor people when this happens to you, but just like random people that will hit me up that say they took some sort of advice or something that we said on this show and they like took some action and they got something from it. That gets me more fired up than any deal that we do. Way cooler. And, and it's funny because you hear, like, I've heard other people say that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you say that because you're making money and this and that. And it's like, no, it actually really is pretty badass. Yeah. And and it wasn't until probably recently that I understood that goal of helping people can be somewhat altruistic. Is it? Because it does feel good. It's still selfish. And like the term altruistic is somewhat, maybe it doesn't apply here, but like helping people, maybe it is more selfish than altruistic is what I'll say, I guess. Helping people feels good to me. It does. Genuinely feels good. I've thought about this and I actually think this is a big reason that like people that have successful real estate companies, they get into like education and everyone's like, well, if it works so well, then why are you doing this education program? I'm trying to steal my money. It's like, no, like you don't understand. I no longer get the dopamine hit from getting deals. 
It is an right. expectation right. for my yes. business. Like if anything, I'm either neutral or I'm fucking depressed because we're not signing deals, right? There's right. no longer the upside. Yep. But I can re-get that dopamine hit by having somebody else who's like, I get it. Like you helped right. me get this and that's super fulfilling. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can help somebody get to the next level in their career or something <laughs> big. Have They have some level of breakthrough. Yeah. I mean, it's just super cool. I, I enjoy it. So I'm showing gratitude today. Yeah. I like it. To our so, audience. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. If you enjoy the show, please share it with anybody else who might find it interesting, whether they like real estate business or just two guys talking trash. It's always, we're always good for at least one of those things on like any given episode. Go and, uh, you know, hopefully you can share it. And my goal is for our next 100 episodes, I want to be 10x as big as we are now. I feel like that's like the new thing. You're not trying to double, you're 10X. trying to like 10x, right? Like Grant Cardone, that's like 2017, bro. After that, he's still, he's still leaning into it. You know, like yeah. that, that's, that's, <laughs> he's got his brand. It works out well. But yeah, so help us get there by sharing this with everybody, leaving us a five-star review. Also too, a great way to spread the word is you can buy some Collecting Keys merch. If you go to store.collectingkeyspodcast.com and uh, that's, like, that's something else that gets me fired up. We've had several people that have like bought shirts now from there that like, you know, we like bought a front bunch there that we accept to people and those sort of things. But actually having cold people buy your merch. Oh, I love we that. We have like a $2 margin. And every time I'm like, yes. Like, <laughs> it got dopamine. <laughs> you got yeah. it, man. It's awesome. Yeah. But got them. Yeah. Got them. So store.collectingkeyspodcast.com. You can go there. Pick what is one of the, t-shirt. what's the favorite item on the store actually so our listeners know? It's not the BDE shirts, Dan. It's just the collecting I t-shirts. figured as much. Yeah. Yeah. Really selfish. I just wanted to know the BDE shirt was popular. Popular. I think we're the only ones that have bought the BDE shirt for people. Oh, sorry. Guarantee it. Yeah, it's not <laughs> that cool. <laughs> Plus, you can't go to your like in law's house wearing a shirt that says BDE on it with a guy's random dude's face on it. It's just as weird. Absolutely can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I mean, man. especially during like lake season, like what else do you want? That's like a, a lake we shirt. We do need right to get there. some tanks, man. We do. I get some tank tops yeah. for, for lake season. We'll get some of those in there. Anyways, store.collectingkeyspodcast.com. Go check that out. And uh, yeah, guys, appreciate y'all listening. And here's to another 100 episodes. Talk to you guys next week. See ya.